I think when it comes to holding the right view on things, I think there's different layers of when it comes to, or methodology when it comes to approaching things. Obviously, if we want to know what the right view is on a certain topic, it should come through wrestling with Bible text. And then if there ends up being several texts with deal with a certain topic, harmonizing <laughs> those texts. And so, you know, going to the Bible and looking at specific passages is the major thing. But I'm sure you guys know from hermeneutics class or just your own study of things that hermeneutics often has a big role to play in how people understand passages, right? I mean, if, if, if different people have different hermeneutical assumptions of how to go about understanding scripture, they're going to come, they're, they're going to have, you know, different, different interpretations. And, and I've become convinced that I think there, there may even be a step before the hermeneutics, which may just be your presuppositions of how God does things. And so I've, I've kind of wrestled a little bit with the what comes first, the chicken or the egg, like what's prior, the presuppositions or the hermeneutics or the hermeneutics before the presuppositions. And um, that's a real close call. Um, I'm probably leaning at this point to perhaps even thinking perhaps people's presuppositions of how they think things should be perhaps may even influence hermeneutics. So now as I talk about presuppositions, I'm not talking about postmodernist subjectivity and everybody has presuppositions, so it doesn't matter just what you think. That's not the sort of thing at all. I think when we're evaluating presuppositions, we want to, we're, we're mostly looking to evaluate whether how we think things work really is with what God says. <laughs> and so, so like personally, I find it helpful to examine my presuppositions because sometimes when I do, I realize that, oh, my worldview's been tainted a little bit by this other <laughs> worldview. And so and that, that allows us to make changes and to make sure our presuppositions line up with what God would have us to do. Because I think our goal is to have, you know, you know bi biblical presuppositions. You know, of course, you, you talk about that in apologetics class, particularly as we, we talk about presuppositionalism where you're talking about your starting points for knowledge. And so there, there's good presuppositions and bad presuppositions. I mean, believing God exists, that's a good presupposition. Believing the Bible is the word of God, that's a good presupposition. And just because something's a presupposition doesn't mean that there's not support for it. And so a person can have a presupposition. And then if you ask, why do you have that presupposition? Hopefully you're able to explain, you know, why, that, why that's the case. So just to let you know, uh, in this particular area, we're discussing uh, presuppositions when it comes to God's purposes. So uh, and I'll start out on here. Much attention in recent years has been devoted to the influence of Greek philosophy on Christian doctrine. This has been especially true in regard to the nature of God as debate exists as to whether Greek ideas have influenced traditional views concerning God's immutability. Some have also contended that Christian eschatology has been negatively influenced by Greek Platonic assumptions and ideas. Uh, Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven, for instance, asserts that biblical eschatology has been largely replaced by Christoplatonism, which is an invalid merger of Christianity and the ideas of Plato. And I like that term. And by the way, just so you know, I, I, I like what Alcorn has to say on this uh, particular issue here. Um, I like the term Christoplatonism <laughs> because I think it is true that Christians as a whole oftentimes have kind of merged a Christian worldview with some uh, Platonist thinking. According to Alcorn, common conceptions of heaven are often influenced more by Plato's ideas than they are the Bible. So the purpose of what we're doing now, this paper is to discuss Platonism's influence on Christian eschatology, we will summarize what Platonism is, survey the imp impact of Platonism on Christian eschatology, one with a summary of observations of how Christians should view the relationship between Platonism and eschatology. Okay, so what, what is, you know, Platonism? And if you've had, you know, inter introduction to philosophy classes, I'm sure you've probably come across. I mean, when you're dealing with Plato, you're dealing with one of the most, you know, influential philosophers in history. There end up being, you know, certain ones that just make huge, huge, uh, you know, impact, you know, Plato and Aristotle and Descartes and Kant and Hume, there just ends up being certain individuals that even if people haven't, they don't really, under, have never heard of those guys or they've never really thought much about it, oftentimes they can be influenced. Um, Plato is not just some interesting historical figure 
for philosophy classes, his, his ideas have influenced people for you know, centuries and centuries of how they view reality. So, you know, he lived, you know, around the, you know, the fifth and fourth century BC. Plato was one of the first philosophers to argue that reality is primarily ideal or abstract. With his theory of forms, he asserted that ultimate reality is not found in objects and concepts that we experience on earth. Instead, reality is found in forms or ideas that exist in another realm. These forms operate as perfect universal templates for everything we experience. So, for example, all horses on earth, according you know, to his view, would be imperfect replicas of the universal hoarseness that exists in another dimension. And so, you know, so in other words, whenever you, you, you see you know, anything you know, in the world that we experience, those things end up being imperfect replicas of a perfect template in another realm. So, and again, that'll be part of the reason why, you know, if you, you know, in our sense experience, if we were to see a horse with four legs and a horse with three legs, we would know that the horse with four legs is better to the ideal because supposedly there's some sort of, you know, template of, of perfection that there's some knowledge of. So one result, now again, th that we're, my goal here is not to go into a whole history lesson of Plato, but one result of Platonism was the belief that the realm of forms transcends the physical world and that the realm of matter is inferior to the spiritual. And, and that's really the main thing right here. Is, I mean, this is going to be one thing where you know, I think there's almost a unanimity among what, whatever your theological, philosophical pers persuasion is, is that Plato helped promote the idea of a, somewhat of a dualism where spirit is more, is more superior than matter. So moving on, there's a dualism between matter and the immaterial. This perspective naturally leads to negative perceptions concerning the nature of the physical world and even our human bodies. Plato's account of Socrates is one such example. Again, what we know about Socrates comes from Plato. So there's a very close connection here. When sentenced to death, Socrates rebuked his friends for mourning over him by declaring that he longed for death so he could escape his carnal body and focus on higher spiritual values in a spiritual realm. So for Plato, the human body is like a tomb for the soul. And so, you know, so with the account with Socrates, you know, his friends wanted to break him out and he was just like, no, he was actually looking forward to death so he could escape the carnal body so that his spirit, in a sense, can move on into another dimension, which was superior. So, and then the idea of the human body being like a tomb for the soul, you know, you've definitely seen that idea that matter is bad, but spiritual is good, getting rid of the physical is good. Plato's ideas have had an enormous impact. Gary Habermas, you know, who's a Christian philosopher, observes that Plato's concept of forms along with his cosmology and his views on the immortality of the soul, probably, is ha probably has the greatest influence in the philosophy of religion. And you might say here, well, where, you know, what, what's the connection here? The connection we're going to see as we discuss things is there's going to be a long history, even within Christianity, where, where physical things are going to be viewed negatively, just in and of themselves. And so that's where there's... Can, can be an intersect. This exaltation of the spiritual over the physical in Platonism carried over to Judaism as evidenced by the writings of Philo. Philo, in an attempt to make the Old Testament more attractive to the Greeks, influenced by the Platonic ideal, allegorized many Old Testament passages that appeared too crass and unworthy of God. Statements in the Old Testament that discuss the wrath of God or God changing his mind needed to be allegorized. So now you can see here that it's hitting a, you know, a little bit closer to home because now you're seeing those that maybe have some sort of uh, biblical worldview or framework of looking at things are starting to adopt some of these uh, sorts of thinking. <clears throat> Platonism also influenced its more religious counterpart, Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism was a complex system for understanding reality that was founded by the Roman philosopher Plotinus. The Egyptian-born Plotinus carried on some of the main ideas of Plato, such as 
there is an immaterial reality that exists apart from the physical world, a strong distinction between an immaterial soul and the physical body, and three, the immortal soul finds its ultimate fulfillment as it becomes one with an eternal transcendent realm. According to Plotinus, the basis of all reality is an immaterial and indescribable reality called the one or the good. There are several levels of reality that emanate from the one, much like ripples in a pond emanate from a dropped stone. The second level of reality is mind or intellect or noose. Mind results from the one's reflection upon itself. The level below mind is soul. Soul operates in time and space and is actually the creator of time and space. Soul looks in two directions, upward to mind and downward to nature, which created the physical world. According, according to Plotinus, the lowest level of reality is matter. Thus, matter is viewed very negatively in Neoplatonism. Plotinus himself held such disgust for physical things that he even despised his own body. At times, he did not take care of his physical health or hygiene. So he was being consistent with his worldview. He just said, since the body's bad, I'm not even going to be take care of myself. Yep. Uh, what's the difference between Neoplatonism and Platonism? <clears throat> Neoplatonism is more of, of a religious form. Uh, Platonism is more abstract. What you get with Neoplatonism is more of an attempt to, more, more of a religious form. What relationship did this have to like Gnosticism? I think there's a, there, there's a line of connection that's, that's going on there. So the, the <coughs> Gnosticism, and obviously you're having forms of Gnosticism before Plotinus, but you're, you're seeing this. There, there, when we talk about Gnosticism as an enemy of the church, that's a form of Platonism. And that's how come you're starting to get some of the, uh, some of the statements in, in John that at first, you know, in, in the letters of John that almost don't seem to make sense. We're talking about you know, somebody's denying that Jesus has come in the flesh. We're like, well, who does that? <laughs> you know, in our modern world. But that was the sort of thing they were starting to deal with more and more uh, back then. So, because... You know, Gnosticism is obviously going to be a major threat to the church, and they're denying the physicality of Christ and the, and the goodness of the physical realm. Even, I think one of the main things that's coming at this particular time is the idea that perfection is the deliverance comes as a spiritual savior comes into our yucky physical realm and helps deliver our souls from the physical realm to go be one with the absolute. <laughs> Um, if you're thinking that sounds a lot like some of the Eastern religions, there's, th that's, that's the case. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, that's one of the things you do see with, uh, I think with like with Hinduism and Buddhism is, you know, things that are physical are their illusion that w uh, the, the true nirvana or perfection is, is escaping sense awareness and, uh, the illusions of the world and becoming one with the absolute. Okay, so how about uh, Platonism's influence on early Christian theologians? A uh, point that we're going to make here is, I mean, and I, I'm sure, again, from your own personal study or from historical theology, uh, you, you've probably come across the fact that a lot of the early Christian theologians were really fascinated with Greek philosophy. I think from our standpoint, so, sometimes too much. <laughs> and so I think what we're going to end up seeing is we're going to end up seeing a lot of the early Christian theologians being influenced by Platonism, and then that's also going to affect their hermeneutic of how they understand a lot of the physical, national things that take place in the Bible. And by the way, just so you know, we'll, uh, we usually take breaks around the, the end of the hour. We usually go longer on the first leg of the class, take a break, and then it's shorter on the, on the second. So we'll go a few more minutes before we break. Okay, now this, this is where it hits a little bit more home in regard to Christianity. Many of the early Christians were not suspicious of or threatened by Plato. According to Diogenes Allen, Plato astounded the apologists and the early church fathers. For instance, when early Christians encountered Plato's creation story in the Timaeus, some believed that he had read Moses or received his insights from divine revelation. The similarity of some of Plato's ideas with Christianity was seen as evidence why pagans should be open to Christianity. Platonic thinking thus influenced significant theologians of the early church. This was true for the Christians of the Eastern Church, particularly those in the Alexandrian tradition, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen. And this is where I think understanding your church history can be helpful here. I mean, you're familiar of the, you know, the Alexandrian 
versus the Antiochian school when it comes to hermeneutics, the Alexandrian is going to be very influenced by Greek philosophy and Platonism, which is going to affect their hermeneutics. As Jeffrey Burton Russell states, the great Greek fathers of Alexandria, Clement and Origen, firmly grounded in scripture, were also influenced by Platonism and Stoicism. Theologians, this is on page 327, theologians of the Alexandrian tradition carried a high view of Greek philosophy and attempted to show that Christianity was consistent with the best of Greek philosophy. Viviano points out that Clement of Alexandria followed in the footsteps of his predecessor Philo by adopting a preference for an allegorical meaning of history which turns out upon closer acquaintance to transform much biblical history into general moral truths of a philosophical cast. For Clement, God used philosophy to prepare the Greeks for Christ just like he used the law of Moses to prepare the Hebrew people for Christ. Clement held Socrates and Plato in high regard. He even believed that Plato served a role that was similar to that of Moses. In line with Greek philosophy, Clement viewed the body and matter as lesser in nature than the spirit, although he did not view the body as evil. So one of the things that I'm getting at, and this what I'm getting after, and this is where I think Alcorn's concept of the Christoplatonism helps, is these Alexandrian fathers that we're talking about, they don't just totally capitulate to Platonism. I mean, if they did totally, it would end up being in heresy. I mean, fortunately, most of these guys, although there's some doubt about origin, still are affirming, you know, the resurrection of the body. So as I'm talking about this, it's not a full capitulation, but it is a merger. I mean, it is a, some healthy doses of Platonism and sometimes a dualism between the spirit uh, and the body. Uh, origin of Alexandria was important in bringing Platonism into Christianity. As McGrath has observed, Origen was a highly creative theologian with a strongly Platonist bent. Viviano also points out that Origen wrought some bold changes in Christian eschatology. Origen dissolved the Christian expectation of the resurrection of the body into the immortality of the soul, since Christian perfection consists on this Platonizing view in a progressive dematerialization. So Origen was getting pretty close to crossing the line in that regard. He even went further than most of the early Christian theologians by asserting that the resurrection body was purely spiritual. Origen also understood kingdom text in the Bible in a purely spiritual, interior, private, and realized sense. And so I think that's going to be really significant is, I mean, my theory would be as Platonism eventually begins to impact more of the church, and they start to elevate the spiritual over the material, I think that will contribute to the shift from a strongly premillennial view to more of a, what eventually will grow into an amillennial view. So, yes, I am saying it. I, I do think that the origins of amillennialism have a strong Platonist bent. That's not a statement that all amillennials today are Platonist, or as a matter of fact, I think most amillennialists today have much more new creation model in their thinking than the earlier amillennialist. But when you're looking at the development of amillennialism in history, it's going to be heavily influenced as, as certain theologians adopt a Platonist view, that's going to tend more towards an allegorical hermeneutic, which means changes in how the kingdom and the people of God are viewed. So, <clears throat> the influence of Platonic thinking was not just on on the theologians of the Eastern tradition, Alistair McGrath observes that Ambrose, you know, who was Augustine's mentor, he drew upon the ideas of the Jewish Platonist writer Philo in promoting a Platonic world of ideas and values rather than a physical or geographical entity. Ambrose's pupil, Augustine of Hippo, too, was influenced by Platonic thinking. Allen refers to Augustine as one of the great Christian Platonists. According to Gary Habermas, Christian thought also came under the influence of Platonism as scholars of the third century, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen, mixed this Greek philosophy with their theology. In particular, Augustine's interpretation of Plato dominated Christian thought for the next thousand years after his death in the fifth century. In his Confessions, Augustine openly describes the help he received from the Platonist. Augustine was also influenced by Neoplatonism as well. As Viviano states, we need only note that Augustine was strongly influenced by Neoplatonic philosophy and has even read Plotinus and Prophery. This philosophy was highly spiritual and otherworldly, 
centered on the one and the eternal, treating the material and the historically contingent as inferior stages in the ascent of the soul to union with the one. Uh, Viviano summarizes the impact of Augustine's Platonic thinking on the kingdom of God. Thus, Augustine was attracted to the spiritual interpretation of the kingdom we have already seen in origin. Indeed, ultimately for Augustine, the kingdom of God consists in eternal life with God in heaven. That is, you know, the city of God uh, as opposed you know, to, the, to, the, to the city which has taken place on the earth. Augustine's spiritual view of the kingdom contributed to his belief that the period of the church on earth is the thousand year reign of Christ. According to Viviano, Augustine's views would dominate and become the normal Roman Catholic view down to our own times. It is difficult to deny the importance of Platonic thinking. As Habermas points out, Plato has exercised an enormous influence on Western thought and must therefore be dealt with by those of all philosophical pers persuasions. And this also applies to the area of Christian theology. Yes, Obed. So, Augustine, Origen, all of these guys, do we now view them as heretics? Because the people that Augustine influenced? No, I mean, all Augustine and Origen, or you know, who made... Yeah, how do we view those guys that are buying into it? Yeah, no. yeah. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, I would say it's the, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, I think with almost all of these guys that we're talking about, there ends up being a lot of good and a lot of not good. <laughs> and so, I mean, Augustine, if you're going by influence, out, you know, for, for those outside of the apostles in Christ in church history, he's the most influential theologian of all time. I mean, even the reformers themselves are trying to, they're dealing with him as they're, as they're doing their things. I mean, um, as far as Augustine, he does, I mean, we saw, if you're in Theo 3, we talk a lot of good things Augustine does. <laughs> Total depravity is moner monergistic understanding of salvation. So there's, there's a lot about Augustine that can be embraced. He's also known as the father of amillennialism. And I think some of the stuff he does with the sacramental view of things and his ecclesiology Let's just put it this way. When, when it comes to his view of man and soteriology in certain areas, I embrace what I think is good. I think when it comes to some of his ecclesiology and eschatology, not so good. So when it comes to origin, or, I, mean, or, I mean, origin really is, <laughs> gets, gets close to teaching some heretical, heretical things there. I mean, he's, so I, I wouldn't even say that they're in the same category. As far, yeah. That's why I think when a lot of times when you're dealing with church history, to me, I I, I usually don't, I, I usually are evaluating them on their beliefs as a whole, taking into account the details as opposed to just making a blanket statement of this guy's good or this guy's bad. It, uh, I guess at this particular point, the, the main thing that you should grasp through the details of what we've looked at is there's. It's, it's not even debatable. <laughs> it's pretty much unanimous that uh, not so much with the early, early church fathers, but when you start to drift, you know, particularly when you're in the, you know, the latter part of the 200s and into the, in, into the 300s, there really starts to be an embracing of uh, some of the elements of, of, of Platonism, merging it with Christianity, and that's leading to a more spiritualized view of God's purposes. So in light of that, what I want to talk to you about now is two models of eschatology. And we'll, we'll, uh, as we introduce these concepts, we'll be referring to these concepts through the whole rest of the class. There's going to be a spiritual vision model. There's spiritual vision model. And then there's new creation model. These are models, they're heuristic, you know, teaching devices. When we talk about a model here, we're not even necessarily saying it belongs to one person or to one camp. I would actually probably say that when you're looking at different theological camps or even people, people probably, people in camps probably have mixes of these at various times. But anyway, let's go ahead and explain it. Um, at this point, we're gonna shift specifically to the topic of Platonism and Christian eschatology. According to Craig Blazing, and this is where his uh, 
those 21 or 22 pages in the, in the uh, three views of the millennium book. Remember I had you target that for the, for the reading for today. This is where a lot of the material that I'm drawn is, is coming off of because he, you know, he's, he's coined these terms. This discussion of spiritual vision model, new creation model, it's been picked up in other works. Um, I think even like in uh, <clears throat> Russell Moore's book, The Kingdom of Christ, where he's dealing with dispensationalism and covenant theology, he uses Blazing's model as he's, uh, the models as he's, or terminology as he's tracking these things. So according to Blazing, <clears throat> there have been two broad models of eternal life that have been held by Christians since the time of the early church. The first he calls the spiritual vision model, and this model is influenced by Platonism. With this model, heaven is viewed primarily as a spiritual entity. Heaven is the highest level of ontological reality, the realm of spirit as opposed to base matter. This is the destiny of the saved who will exist in that non-earthly non -earthly spiritual place as spiritual beings engaged internally or eternally in spiritual activity. So that's the kind of the, I'm not talking about us or Christians that have studied the issues, but just kind of the ge general understanding of eschatology that permeates our culture where, you know, when people die, their spirit goes to heaven forever where they're on the cloud with a halo playing a harp for all of eternity sort of thing. I mean, you see that in the cultural depictions all over the place. When I show you my PowerPoint presentation, I point out some of those cultural depictions. Um, you know, there's been surveys and studies of average, you know, I think most Americans believe that their eternal destiny is just in the spiritual realm. Uh, that's, you know, heavily platonic. So the spiritual vision model, <clears throat> Blazing argues, is a combination of biblical themes and cultural ideas that were common to classical philosophical tradition. And by the way, when we talk about biblical themes, I think they would be perhaps at times biblical themes that are wrongly understood. <laughs> you know, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul's talking about the spiritual body, some people think he's talking about being a ghost. When in reality, a lot of the time, what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about a spiritual body is a physical body whose origin is heaven. <laughs> its origin is spiritual, but it's not a non-physical body. So I think when we talk about the spirituality of our bodies and of the new Jerusalem and of the, the new earth and all those sorts of things, they're not statements that they go from being physical to just spiritual, but their origin is heaven. Just like the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean heaven is the kingdom. The kingdom comes from heaven. The kingdom sources heaven, but it's also a kingdom according to Daniel 2 and 7 that destroys earthly kingdoms and itself is established and fills the whole earth. So I just didn't want you to be confused on that because <clears throat> I think sometimes what ends up happening is people, if they have platonic assumptions, may go into the Bible and then read something into the Bible that it's not really saying. So things like, you know, the promise of believers will see God, believers will receive full knowledge. The description of heaven is the dwelling place of God. The description of heaven is the destiny of the believing dead prior to the resurrection. <clears throat> In addition... Uh, to the biblical themes, the spiritual vision model also drew upon cultural Greek ideas that were common to the classical philosophical tradition. So those uh, biblical themes get merged with the contrast between spirit and matter, identification of spirit with mind or intellect, belief that eternal perfection entails the absence of change. According to Blazing, all, central to all three, of these is the classical tradition's notion of an ontological hierarchy in which spirit is located at the top of a descending order of being. Elemental matter occupies the lowest place. Heaven is realm of spirit as opposed to matter. Heaven is a non-earthly, again, this is according to the spiritual vision model, it's a non-earthly spiritual place for spiritual beings who are engaged only in spiritual activity. This heaven is also free from all change. Eternal life, therefore, is viewed primarily as cognitive, meditative, or contemplative. So kind of that idea that, well, you know, you ever hear people say, well, what are we going to do in heaven? You know, we're just going to be, you know, very static. You know, I mean, I grew up, you know, I grew up Catholic. I think a lot of you know that. 
And I remember being, I don't know, 11 or 12 and asking my mother, who's also Catholic, what do you think we're gonna do in heaven? And she says, we're gonna stare into the light and feel joy. Which is kind of that, you know, kind of that be the beatific vision where it's very, you know, very, uh, you know, very, very static. So, um, kind of the idea of the cognitive, the meditative, the contemplative. The spiritual vision model has led many Christians to view eternal life as the beatific vision of God and unbroken, unchanging contemplation of the infinite reality of God. In his book, Models of the Kingdom, Howard Snyder points out that a purely spiritual view of the kingdom, which he calls the kingdom as inner spiritual experience model, may be traced to the influence of Platonist and Neoplatonist ideas on Christian thinking. That's one thing you're going to see, and this is where it does intersect with eschatology, is uh, you know, the very, very early church was heavily premillennial. And they were expecting second coming with an earthly kingdom. As things go on, the kingdom starts to be more of an inner experience, more of like a spiritual sort of thing. Uh, Snyder says, historically, this is from the block quote, historically, this model has often been tainted with a sort of platonic disdain for things material. Perhaps seeing the body or matter as evil, or at least imperfect and imperfectible. It is thus dualistic, viewing the higher spiritual world as essentially separate from the material world. The spiritual vision model was inherently linked to allegorical and spiritual methods of interpretation that were opposed to literal interpretation based on historical grammatical context. Blazing notes that the spiritual vision model, quote, was intimately connected with practices of spiritual interpretation that were openly acknowledged to be contrary to the literal meaning of the words being interpreted. The long-term practice of reading scripture in this way so conditioned the Christian mind that by the late Middle Ages, the spiritual vision model had become an accepted fact of the Christian worldview. <clears throat> so think of this from a church history perspective. You know, it's really, you know, in, in the later 200s and in the 300s, I think you're really seeing this shift towards more, from more of a literal understanding of the kingdom and God's purposes to more of the kingdom purposes being spiritual. You definitely have Augustine go with a more spiritualized view of the kingdom. As you go, you know, Augustine then transitions you into the, mid, into the Middle Ages and the, the dominant era of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, you definitely, when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, very, 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 very spiritual vision model-ish. So when, he's, when Blazing says the spiritual vision model had become an accepted fact of the Christian worldview, you know, that's pretty significant. I mean, most people, when they're thinking of God's purposes, they're very, very spiritualized. And I would say overly spiritualized or so. Again, I would say as a person, like I said, who grew up Roman Catholic with Roman Catholic descendants and parents, when I asked about heaven, I was given spiritual vision model. <laughs> so these are things that are still very applicable to today. So in contrast to the spiritual vision model, the second model Blazing discusses is a new creation model. This model emphasizes the, the physical, social, political, and geographical aspects of eternal life more than does the spiritual vision model. It emphasizes a coming new earth, the renewal of life on this new earth, bodily resurrection, and social and political interactions among the redeemed. So notice the things you know, that are being talked about here, physical things, social things, political things, even national things. Uh, as he states, the new creation model expects that the ontological or the essence, you know, we're dealing with reality and being, the ontological order and scope of eternal life, now listen to this, is essentially continuous with that of present earthly life, except for the absence of sin and death. So in other words, this is arguing, it's not necessarily arguing that everything in the eschaton is exactly the same as it is now, but when it comes, there's still a lot of similarity and continuity minus sin, curse, and death. So there's people, there's relationships, there's physicality, there's culture, there's food, <laughs> there's social dynamic, those sorts of things which are probably, we would consider perhaps to be more, 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 uh, more, more colorful or more diverse. Thus eternal life is embodied life on earth. This approach does not reject physicality or materiality 
<clears throat> but affirms them as essential both to a holistic anthropology and to the biblical idea of a redeemed creation. This approach, according to Blazing, follows the language of passages like Isaiah 25, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, Revelation 21, Romans 8, which speak of a regenerated earth and activity and those sorts of things. By the way, those are all passages that we are going to look at. So, I mean, I'm just mentioning them right now. But passages that are talking about, you know, diverse things that are uh, taking place. Uh, notice earlier when we talked about the fact does not reject physicality or materiality, but affirms them as an essential both to a holistic anthropology. That's where I do think that there's an intersect here with anthropology and what we're talking about here. <clears throat> you know, if you had the O3, what, you know, what did we spend the first few weeks talking about? God created man as a complex unity of the material and the immaterial. I mean, God didn't create Adam to just be in a spirit that, you know, that just does nothing. You know, he created Adam to do things and to rule and subdue the creation that God made. So with the new creation model, you know, it's saying there's, there's going to be continuity between Genesis 1 and Revelation 21 and 22. You know, like I said, when God created Adam, he didn't just create him as a spirit and put him in one locale just to think all the time. He was to be active. He was to be physical, although not just physical. So perhaps in the eschaton, there's physicality and activity and diversity and, and, and those sorts of things. Now, if you think about it, if the spiritual vision model is right, again, we're just dealing with the model. We're not even dealing with the person at this point. But if the model is right, God created Adam very good in his original state with the physical element. But when it comes to the final es eschatology, it's just spirit. So you go from one to another. The new creation model appears to have been the primary approach of the church of the late first and early second centuries AD. It was found in apocalyptic and rabbinic Judaism in the second century. Christian writers such as Irenaeus but as Blazing asserts, the spiritual vision model would take over and become, quote, the dominant view of eternal life from roughly the third century to the early modern period. So, no, so Blazing will argue is that the church, you know, the, I mean, he would argue and I would agree that the, the, the New Testament saints and apostles are affirming more in line with this, but eventually as time goes by, there's more of a shift towards this sort of thinking. So there's more of a shift from this to this with, you know, influence of Platonism. Okay, any thoughts at this point? Yep, bud. How much do you think that had to do with the delay of the kingdom coming because the Lord tarried? Do you think yeah. any of that played into I think that's part of it. And I also think the uh, Constantinian merger of church and state I mean, the church, now we all understand there's not equal persecution all throughout the first few centuries. But basically with Constantine, there's a, there's a light that's, there's a switch that's flipped. <laughs> church is persecuted minority looking for the second coming of Christ in his kingdom to, hey, the church is the kingdom. So there, there's a big shift in eschatology, I think, not only, but strongly linked to Constantinian's, Constantine's kingdom. I mean, Eusebius, who's doing his thing for Constantine viewed Constantine's kingdom as the messianic banquet. So, so I would say Augustine views, and obviously he's coming. So I, I guess I would say, is you, you, I mean, the influence of Platonism on the Alexandrian tradition and beyond, a, um, Constantinian merger of church and state, the views of Augustine, by the time you hit go into the 500s of the Roman Catholic Church, spiritual vision model is very embedded. And then it carries sway. Now we haven't gotten there yet, but I, I think the Reformation to a large degree is gonna be a breakthrough because it may not change things overnight, but it starts to reject a lot of the hermeneutics. And then, you know, then we'll, we, we'll talk about that when we go from there. All right, any other thoughts? <clears throat> okay. Uh, Impact of Platonism on eschatology. Randy Alcorn has specifically addressed the impact of Platonism on Christian eschatology. In doing so, he has coined the term Christoplatonism, 
<clears throat> As the title suggests, Christoplatonism is a philosophy that has blended elements of Platonism with Christianity. But as he points out, this merger is not a good thing since the mixture of Platonism and Christianity, quote, has poisoned Christianity and blunted its distinct differences from Eastern religions. And I was really happy when I read that, when I heard him make that connection with the Eastern religions, because I'd made that connection on my own. I mean, as I, you know, I mean, before I taught here, I was teaching humanities at a, at a, at a community college and I was teaching world religions. And as you just study the Eastern religions, it's, this sounded very similar. Like physical's bad, spiritual's good, you know, got to escape this realm to go merge with an absolute. Uh, e eternity's very impersonal, you know, that sort of thing. So there, there's definitely similarity. According to Alcorn, Christoplatonism's pervasive influence has caused many Christians to resist the following biblical truths. Bodily resurrection of the dead, life on the new earth, eating and drinking in heaven, walking and talking in heaven, living in dwelling places, traveling down streets, going through gates from one place to another, ruling, working, playing, engaging in earthly culture. Christoplatonism is evident when the following beliefs are held. Belief that our eternal dwelling place is in a spiritual dimension, not on earth. Now, as I say that, I understand there's an intermediate state, but the Bible doesn't pre present the intermediate state as our final state. You know, Peter says we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth. <clears throat> Two, belief that planet Earth is basically evil and is beyond restoration. Three, belief that heaven is entirely beyond hu human comprehension. Four, belief that our experience in eternity will be mostly that of spiritual contemplation and inactivity. Belief that there is no linear, there's no time or linear progression of history. Belief that there will be no nations or governments, which totally goes against Revelation 21, 24 to 26. Alcorn believes that Christoplatonism has had a devastating inf effect on our ability to understand what scripture says about heaven, particularly about the eternal heaven, the new earth. He cites a statistic from Time Magazine to support this in which two thirds of Americans who believe in the resurrection of the dead do not believe they will have resurrected bodies. According to Alcorn, prevailing ideas of Platonism imposed on eschatology rob Christians of their hope. He says, quote, the human heart cries out for answers about the afterlife, but the answers are not being given, he claims. Many Christians are led to believe that eternity is an unending church service. It's a never ending sing along in the sky. Trying to long for an eternity that is primarily spiritual does not offer real hope. Alcorn states, trying to develop an appetite for a disembodied existence in a non-physical heaven is like trying to develop an appetite for gravel. No matter how sincere we are, no matter how hard we try, it's not going to work, nor should it. So again, I'll just speak for myself, you know, growing up Catholic and then eventually, you know, getting saved and I was 14 or whatever. But as I think about eternal life, I mean, I was, I mean, I had spiritual visual model thinking and I thought that was biblical and I knew I should be excited about it, but I really wasn't. I mean, trying to think of just a static existence, you know, just, but I felt guilty about it because I knew I should <laughs> be excited about that, but that wasn't the case. Alcorn claims that this misunderstanding about the nature of heaven has its roots in, in Satan. He says, See, Satan need not convince us that heaven doesn't exist. He need only convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. If we believe that lie, we'll be robbed of our joy and anticipation. He also, he also mentions that in his research, he collected more than 150 books on heaven, both old and new. One thing I found is that books on heaven are notorious for saying we can't know what heaven is like, but it will be more wonderful than we can imagine. He says, however, the moment we say that we can't imagine heaven, we, we dump cold water on all that God has revealed to us about our eternal home. If we can't envision it, we can't look forward to it. If heaven is unimaginable, why even try? He also appeals to scriptural evidence supporting the idea that the eternal kingdom is a physical place, has much in common with our present experiences on earth, minus the curse, sin, and death. So and I think, I mean, I think there's a balance to this. I don't think anybody's here to say we can know exactly what it's going to be like, but I think, but what heaven will be like or the new earth will be like. But on the other side, I think we've fallen off the other side of the log. We just speaking generally, which is that it's so other than that you almost shouldn't even try to think about it when actually there's a fair amount of scripture discussing what is to come. Okay, now what I want to do at this point is I'm actually not even done with this. You see, I have a section on millennial views and all that. What I want to do is I want to show you how this looks a little bit like how I've 
you know, would just pre present this to, you know, people in church. Okay. And I'm not sure here why this isn't showing up all the way. Display settings. I want to show the big thing. Okay, I'll show you what I got. Maybe. Okay, all right, there it is. For some reason it's showing up as a little box on my screen, but it's big here. Okay, so th this would be like an example of uh, t talking about these ideas with with a uh, you know people in church. Like I said, I, I have this on the course homepage if you're interested in it. Like, okay, for many Christians, and again, there's going to be an intersect with what I've just shared with you. But for many Christians, their understanding of eschatology is foggy at best. They know and are grateful that Jesus has saved them, that they will go to heaven someday, but they're not grasping a clear hope for what God is doing with his, with his universe and his creation. There are two models that Christians in history have worked from in regard to how they view God's purposes. One is a spiritual vision model. The other is a new creation model. The spiritual vision model is a highly spiritualized approach to God's purposes. With this model, heaven is viewed primarily or even only as a spiritual entity. Heaven is the highest level of ontological reality, the realm of spirit as opposed to matter. With this model, heaven is, it's non-earthly, it's disembodied, it's static with no change, no time. If there is any activity, it is only spiritual, such as thinking and singing. By the way, I'm not putting those down, you know, when I say things like it's not just that, it's not a statement that those aren't important. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think there will be corporate worship, and so that's not a put down. It's just whether that's, you know, all that takes place is a different issue. Spiritual vision model is widely held in society. Far side comic book. In the original, underneath it, it says, I wish I'd have brought a magazine. <laughs> so you got the de depiction there. He's, he's sitting on the cloud. He's got his... He's got his uh, wings and he's got his halo and you know okay there's a cream cheese commercial where you kind of see that idea I mean these are all over the place I, I, I wish I could find it but I wasn't able to I, I for years they had those Walgreen commercials for Perfectville where everything was perfect and you know part of their thing was because not everything's perfect you need to go to Walgreens but in Perfectville it would just show all these situations where everything was Nothing ever went wrong anywhere. Uh, there's a children's book by Maria Shriver called What's Heaven? The book describes heaven as a, and this is where she's, I mean, her motives are good. She's trying to help children uh, with the loss of a loved one, but she's not approaching it from a good perspective. She says the book describes heaven as a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk. I ran across a guy on a blog who says, who knows? Maybe heaven will be a place in the clouds where people play shuffleboard. You can't eat and you can't drink because face it, you're a spirit now. And what you were used to on earth is no longer necessary. In heaven, discovering and examining would, would no longer be necessary because everything is already explained. So again, these are kind of funny, but these are common perceptions that a lot of people have. So, but notice, it, you know, it's a place in the clouds. People play shuffleboard. Well, what does shuffleboard indicate? You know, that's kind of what old people do or kind of a whatever the most boring activity could be. Notice you can't eat and you can't drink because, face it, you're a spirit now. So there's not going to be any continuity with our present life at all. Notice the discovering and examining no longer necessary because you get the omniscience chip. And so there's no joy of learning anything because you know it all. Okay, here's a guy up at the gates of heaven. Yeah, I know your idea of heaven was to play golf all day, but all we have is shuffleboard. <laughs> Countless times it's been heard, I'd rather be in hell than heaven. Heaven's boring and hell is where my friends are having a great party. Here's just another, just found it looking online. Heaven is boring. Halo throwing a paper airplane. Okay, what happened here? Just hit the button, nothing's happening. Ah, I got a technical glitch here. Let me see if I can, maybe I can get this figured out here, hold on.
Okay, there we go. Okay, two people up in heaven. So what do you guys do for fun? Oh, we sing and read the Bible. Well, that sounds like you guys really cut loose. Again, kind of irreverent, but kind of that idea of... In 1868, novel by Elizabeth Stuart Phelp, The Gates Ajar asked if she were very good up in heaven, would they let her go down to play in hell on Saturday afternoons? Which is really a scary, <laughs> but, a, but in, in cultural depiction there. Okay, I think a lot of what we've just looked at would be a lot of what a lot of non-believers would probably think. But even Christians can struggle with what heaven will be like. General impressions of heaven. One big one is that heaven is a mystical, disembodied spiritual existence. Second, many believe that heaven will be boring. Other ideas of heaven include wings and clouds, sitting around thinking or singing all the time, no change, everything is static. No time, there's no enjoyment. Uh, leave the favorite things behind. We know everything, there's no learning because we know everything. Again, I read you the quote from Alcorn where a lot of books on heaven say don't even try to think about what it may be like. How did the spiritual vision model come about? One, through misunderstanding the relationship of the current intermediate heaven with the coming new heavens and new earth. Influence of Platonism on the Christian church. Some of the things that we've talked about. On this first one, misunderstanding the relationship between the intermediate heaven and the coming new heavens and new earth. And, the interme um, and I think this is actually, I mean, this is actually, I think, pretty much worth addressing here because clearly we know that there is an, an intermediate state. <laughs> and so and we would affirm that in this era that we live in between, you know, this present age we live in and the age to come, that when people die, their bodies do go into the ground. Their spirits go to be with the Lord. And so I personally think sometimes what happens is, is people, and this, I would probably see this again more targeted perhaps to believers and unbelievers, but perhaps may project the intermediate state onto the final eternal state. And so because when people do die as believers now, they are in the presence of God, um, like Revelation you know, 6 would indicate um, as their spirits are up in heaven awaiting resurrection, somebody, some people may project that as the final state of things. But the final destination is the new heavens and the new earth. Second Peter 3.13, according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new Jerusalem is viewed as the capital city of the new earth. When you read Revelation 21. And then secondly, the influence of Platonism on the Christian church. We've already covered that, but I would work through some of that with them. So I go through Platonism, you know, uh, Plato and Plotinus. And then introduce the concept of the Christoplatonism. Okay. Okay, then I go into, you know, the whole issue of the new creation model where uh, you know, there's uh, activity and excitement and diversity in those sorts of matters. You know, kind of playing off of the uh, gravel <laughs> comment by Alcorn, um, I also added this, a human can no more long for a purely spiritual existence than a fish could long for a life outside of water. Again, the reason I would say that, that's now how he's created us. He created us as a complex unity of material and immaterial. He didn't create us just to be a spiritual entity. And so thus, the next picture is the fish out of water. That's not what he's created for. I mentioned that the new creation model was the primary approach of the church of the late first and early century, and then eventually things changed. Yeah, there's a few more slides. I'm not gonna run. Like I said, if you wanna view the whole slideshow, you can. But that's just kind of a, you know, we've talked about some academic things. It's just kind of an example of how it can be used in a church setting. Yep. I'm not sure if I'm not sure. 
growing up, my grandma was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I vaguely remember her magazine. They always used to have a picture of heaven, like how you're describing the new creation model. So would you say the Seventh-day, I'm not sure if it's, or would you say they have it right when it comes to their understanding of what heaven would be like? Um. You know, they say sometimes a stop clock is right twice a day kind of thing. I mean, I mean, sometimes some of those groups have a more perhaps holistic understanding than the spiritual vision model. So, again, that doesn't make their whole system right or whatever. But, yeah, I do know that there ends up being, you know, you know, and sometimes that's even sometimes even used. I mean, I mean, sometimes when you get into arguments over millennial views, some will say, well, hey, don't you know this cult group is premillennial? So therefore, you're linked with that or whatever. But, but yeah, from my understanding, I think they have a more, you know, some groups have more of a holistic understanding. That doesn't mean their system's right, but on certain issues, it can be a little bit more, more, accu more accurate. So, okay. Well, let's open it up to uh, you guys, if you guys have any uh, thoughts. Like I said, the, the, the main, main purpose of this was just to, uh, you know, be, be thinking through the, the different models. That, you know, as we, as we progress throughout the class and as we're, interacting with writings and we're discussing things particularly even in like even in the continuity discontinuity book and other writings there, there's going to be um, oftentimes when I'm reading books I'll uh, if I see something that's spiritual vision model like I'll even put it in my notes I'll put SVM there's a lot in my books there's a lot of SVM and NCM <laughs> when somebody's because they're because they're different approaches and tracks towards those things yep yeah, I grew up believing the spiritual vision model and yeah. They always used to say heaven's not going to be boring because we're going to be worshiping God forever and we're going to be discovering things about mm -hmm. God yeah. throughout eternity. But I would agree with that on yeah. its own, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering, I didn't see that part in the slide when you transitioned to the Christian's yeah. view of it. Um, you sort of said, oh, they think it's boring, I don't know. So, yeah. yeah, and uh, this is where I think we. You know, by the way, we will go, we're, we're going to try to go through the, the big passages dealing with these sorts of issues. I mean, the, the thing that we're addressing, right, I, mean, the, I mean, I'm here to affirm the best part of eternity is the God and the, and the throne of God and of the Lamb is there ruling and reigning and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. That, that, that's the primary aspect of, of the eternal kingdom. So, so that is there, and and I don't think we're omniscient, and I think we're always going to be learning more and more about God. Which I, I mean, to me, I think the image of God is primarily relational, and, I, and we talk about that in Do three relationship to God, relationship to others, relationship to the creation. So as we're as we're in the millennium and eventually the eternal state, the way our the image of God fleshes out as it should is in those three relationships. So to me, as I'm affirming these things, I'm emphasizing also the relational aspect. But, at, but the environment, I'm mostly addressing the environment at this point, which is how does that get fleshed out? Is it a very static or, or is it you know, more colorful or multi-purpose? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, can you help me clarify my mind when we define the term heaven? Like, are we referring to yeah, good question. new heavens, new earth, or eternal state, intermediate state? Yeah, no, that's good. <clears throat> I think a lot of times people end up identifying heaven as where God's presence is primarily. So like s some might say the, the intermediate state right now is heaven because that's where God's at. But we know according to Revelation 21 and 22, he, he makes his abode on the earth. So I, I guess I'm okay with that. Uh, let me tell you what I, a definition and then how I usually view it. To me, I think we can define heaven as where God dwells. So I think that, I, I, I think you can refer to the eternal state and the new earth as heaven. Personally, because I think when a lot of people, when they hear of heaven, they think of it as just a spiritual existence. When I talk about the future, I use a lot of uh, new earth language. Because I, I think that's emphasizing the, you know, the, the way that things are going to be for the most part. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, that's that's the way that I would view it. Yeah, I mean, to me, heaven right now is the is the third heaven where God is, where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, where the spirits of those who are to, who die now would go to be with the Lord. Um, when Jesus Christ comes again, He's going to rule on the throne of David on the earth. We know 
in the eternal state that you have the throne of the Father and the Son on the earth in the new Jerusalem. So at that point, that's heaven. But I think it's helpful. I personally have, I, I like to use, because Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66 and Revelation 21 and 2 Peter 3 refer specifically to the new earth. I like to use a healthy, a healthy dose of that in my language because I think it conveys certain things about the, the nature of where we're going. Yep. For the Second Peter reference about we're seeking for a new heaven and a new earth, mm-hmm. the fact that it mentions a new heaven and a new earth, mm-hmm. would that mean like the entire creation is being redone as well? Like the cos- like yeah, I think there's a, the I think there's a, co- yeah, a, a, co- a cosmic renewal. Yeah. Like a whole new universe. Yeah, basically a whole new universe. Yeah. One of the things we'll do in this class is we'll do a lot of parallels between the creation, Genesis 1 to 2 and Revelation 21 to 22. Matter of fact, I have a chart on that that discusses a lot of the, uh, the similarities. I think just as sin introduced chaos into the universe, the reversal, the restoration of all things as that's finally worked out in, impacts all of the created order. Yep. Yeah. So right. following on with Ben, so, <laughs> so is it fair for us to say that there is a two, there are two dispension, dispensations of heaven in a way? Like right now, it is where God dwells, which is spiritual in third heaven. But when the new earth comes, when the new heaven, uh, not, not, new earth no, yeah, come, I think it, yeah. when it comes, the heaven will be then on earth, right. a perfect mixture of material and spiritual. Yeah, I think that's well said. Yeah, yeah I think that's good. All right, any thoughts or questions? Yep. Just quick, you, um, you said briefly that uh, you know, we're talking about a whole new universe, whole new heaven, whole new earth. Yeah. Would you see it as, because uh, Alcorn's book, he talks about, you know, sort of similar to, you know, a, a person, the language in scripture, similar to a person dying and being resurrected yeah. in a perfect body, you know, that he sees a, a continuity in the universe. Renewal. The new heavens and the new earth is right. a renewal, sort of like, the language is almost like you know the, the, the heavens and the earth will pass away, will die, and be yeah. you know resurrected yeah. in perfection. Yeah, I, agree, I agree with him. I think on that particular, he, the, the whole issue when you get to the new earth, is it a renewal of this earth or is it a start over? Is this annihil- Is this present planet annihilated into nothingness with the start over? There's a lot of genuine debate on that. I think you could be a new creation model and go either way. My personal view is it's renewal. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident in that. If someone's not renewal, that doesn't mean that they're not new creation model. I mean, I think you could be new creation model. And that's one issue we'll, we'll talk, we'll get into that issue. So the, the whole renewal versus annihilation with start over is something we'll need to work through. But uh, just so you know, I would, I, I would be more like Alcorn on that. 